a deadly avalanche bursts over the hills. Residents flee for their lives. A boiling cloud of ash, known as pyroclastic flow, flows at up to 200 miles per hour and can be superheated to 1,800 degrees Fahrenheit. The searing ash burns your lungs. Death comes in an instant. 19 days after the eruption of Kilauea, lava is pouring into the Pacific Ocean with explosive results. You've got very, very hot lava coming into contact with the seawater, so you get flash boiling of the seawater. You get some, some chemistry going on, so you get things like hydrochloric acid being produced, which is partly from the chemicals in the lava, but also from the chemicals that you have in seawater. You get a fog or a haze, which include both tiny, tiny particles of volcanic glass and also droplets of acid materials from the seawater. This toxic fog, known as Lays, forces the Coast Guard to declare a safety zone a thousand feet out. But tourist boats draw ever closer, oblivious to the danger that the wind could change direction and send the deadly fog their way. And that's not the only peril. When lava hits cold water, it can explode into the air, scattering chunks of searing rock called lava bombs. A lava bomb is a chunk of lava uh, about this sort of size, and it's often sort of described as the bomb when it's been thrown out in some way from the volcanic activity. Increasing lava flows are now threatening evacuated homes in the nearby Leilani Estates. Local cameraman Demian Berrios is on hand to capture the action as it unfolds. We're standing there, standing on the road, watching these lobes of lava slowly start to cover the road, maybe five feet thick, 10 feet thick, and then you'd look behind and you would just see this huge wall, almost like a bulldozer, just coming down, smack, literally smashing the forest, flopping trees down on their side before it actually consumed them. All residents have been ordered to leave. One by one, people's dreams are devoured by rivers of fire. May 18, 1980, 8.32 a.m. A 5.1 magnitude earthquake rocks Mount St. Helens in southwestern Washington state and triggers the deadliest volcanic eruption in U.S. history in minutes a mushroom-shaped cloud shoots up 10 miles high. Below the cloud, superheated flows of rock and debris surge out of the crater, racing over the land, incinerating everything in its path. No one is prepared for the chaos. Everything within a 230-square-mile area of the mountain is obliterated. 57 people are killed and thousands of acres destroyed. By midday, the eruption ends, leaving a once serene and beautiful region a wasteland. A graceful cone-shaped volcano is now a blasted stump and a nation is in awe of nature's destructive power. But there's one volcano in the U.S. with the potential to wreak devastation on a far greater scale. It's located 575 miles away from Mount St. Helens, in the northwest corner of Wyoming. For over a century, tens of millions of visitors have marveled at Yellowstone's breathtaking scenery. But beneath this spectacular beauty lies a ticking time bomb. Yellowstone is one of the largest volcanic systems on Earth. Scientists call it a supervolcano 
because of the size of past explosions. The criteria that we use to decide whether an eruption is a super eruption is essentially the volume of the eruption. And that is, if an eruption has more than 240 cubic miles or 1,000 cubic kilometers of pumice and ash that came out in that one event, then it's a super eruption. There have been three super eruptions at Yellowstone over the last 2.1 million years. The last big one was 640,000 years ago. The one before that, 666,000 years prior. Which leaves many to wonder, what's next? There have been signs that something unusual may be happening in the park. In 2004, five bison were found dead in a geyser basin. They weren't in a typical death pose, kind of like a cat that's curled up. It looks like they've just fallen over. We think it was just a very cold night, very still night. The geothermal gas has accumulated, and the bison just basically dropped where they stood. The gases were identified as hydrogen sulfide and carbon dioxide, two components of what's found just below the ground at Yellowstone, boiling hot magma. The Yellowstone supervolcano sits on what geologists call a hot spot. Unlike other volcanoes in the world, Yellowstone isn't cone-shaped with a crater at the top. Instead, it's a caldera, a large depression in the Earth, 50 miles long by 30 miles wide, formed during its last major eruption. You can be standing on the caldera without realizing you're standing in the crater of an active volcano, one that's erupted over 25 times since its last superblast. Yellowstone is most famous for its, its very large super eruptions. However, there have been a series of other eruptions. These are smaller than the super eruptions, but they're still enormous events, 50 or so times as big as Mount St. Helens. Given its past, the next Yellowstone super eruption could be the largest natural disaster in recorded history. In our lifetime, we have nothing to compare it with. Recently, scientists have collected new data, giving them a better picture of Yellowstone's underground plumbing. Right beneath the caldera, from the last eruption, sits the magma chamber. And it's fed by a plume of magma stretching down 465 miles northwest into Montana. It's mostly solid rock with the potential to liquefy and scientists are closely monitoring it. Magma, or molten rock, is rising through the plume into the magma chamber at two inches a year. There's no reason for it to stop, although it might come in spurts. Our images show wider parts and narrower parts, so it's like slugs of material that are flowing in a sewer line. And this restless Yellowstone caldera is truly living, breathing, and every once in a while, it burp. The danger is if the plume starts liquefying and moving up at a faster rate. Natural systems uh, can, can throw us a lot of curveballs. A lot of things can happen that we're not really ready for. Scientist Jake Lowenstern is looking for a pattern connecting the supervolcano today and its three prior major eruptions. 2.1 million years ago, 1.3 million years ago, and 640,000 years ago. In two of the really large eruptions at Yellowstone, so much material comes out, entire mountain ranges end up falling into the ground and essentially disappearing. One 50-mile stretch of mountains simply disappeared by collapsing into the magma chamber. University of Toronto geologist John Westgate has tracked the ash from Yellowstone's prior eruptions. It covered much of the United States. It occurs right out of the Pacific Ocean. It even found in the Gulf of Mexico. 
up in northeast Montana, there's a site that we're working on. The tephra is over seven meters thick. These eruptions are enormous. The amount of material erupted from them, huge. When Mount St. Helens erupted in May 1980, it blew off one side of the mountain and triggered an avalanche of snow, mud, ash, and rock. Driven by the wind, the ash landed in 11 states and up into Canada. But that's nothing compared to the amount of ash from Yellowstone's last three major eruptions. In magnitude and volume, each one was far greater than Mount St. Helens. Today, there's little evidence of the supervolcano's violent past. The 50 by 30 mile caldera from the last eruption was covered by lava and ash and smoothed over by glaciers. Forests now conceal the scars. At the top of Villarica Volcano, Dr. Emma Liu and her team are about to fly the latest drone technology into one of the most extreme places on Earth, a crater with an open lava lake. The drone is sniffing the air for clues that could help forecast an eruption. Emma hopes to track how much sulfur dioxide and carbon dioxide is being released. Battery 22.35. Fresh magma contains more CO2, so a high amount of it would indicate the arrival of new magma from deep below into the chamber, which could signal an imminent eruption. They must get low into the crater before the gases disperse in the atmosphere. But the heat and turbulence from the boiling lava could cause the drone to crash at any moment. So you happy with the position? Happy with the position. Right now it's collecting what the passive gas is coming off the lava lake, and then when we see the bubble, we see whether the gas composition changes. Now we just need a bubble burst. Okay, here's a nice plume coming through. You can tell instantly that the change in the, the sound of the motors, you can tell when it hits the turbulence, and instantly I see a spike in sulfur dioxide. Whoa! <laughs> That's a good number. That's a very good number. They've done it they have managed to sample the volcanic gases coming off the lava lake. Okay, okay, returning. Disarmed. Disarmed. Okay. Yes! Megal is safe, we can move around a bit more now. <laughs> yes! yes. <laughs> Success at last. <laughs> we did it. <laughs> oh my God, we've been waiting a year for this. Yeah. So this is the first time that a high resolution multi-gas instrument, so it's measuring multiple different gases, uh, has successfully flown on a drone, measured and returned home safe. Emma and her team now have a powerful new tool to help unravel the mysteries of volcanoes and forecast the next eruption. Today, Villarica is stable but it has erupted before, and it will erupt again. The action starts deep underground, where magma, rich in gases, rises at a fearsome speed. Inside the magma, the gas bubbles begin to expand, and the pressure in the magma chamber increases, until finally the magma bursts through the crater floor in a huge explosion. Powered by the expansion of gases, molten rock would blast out of the volcano. Lava would stream down the slopes, a force of nature nothing can stop. On our experimental V-Day, Villarica won't be alone. There are around 900 arc volcanoes just like it, all around the edge of the Pacific, which, like Villarica, are created by the Pacific Ocean Plate, sinking beneath the surrounding American and Asian continents. This is known as the Ring of Fire. On the morning of V-Day, they are our second wave of eruptions, exploding magma around the world.
May 3rd, 2018. Hundreds of small earthquakes strike Big Island. Cracks in the ground open up and unleash scalding jets of steam. Then, at 10.31 a.m., a powerful earthquake. This one rating 5.0 on the Richter scale. Matt Page and his family can't feel the earthquake. They're taking a helicopter ride to view the island's most famous volcano, and they're about to get more than they bargained for. Suddenly, a boiling cloud of steam and ash burst thousands of feet into the air. The volcano was starting to bubble up, and this cloud just gets bigger and bigger and fills the whole sky, and we're just kind of like, wow, this is crazy. You know, I had no idea it would be like this. And then as the pilot flew away, he says, I've been doing this seven years, and I've never seen anything like that. Ash rising from the volcano looks impressive, but a greater menace lurks beneath the ground. Millions of tons of molten magma is forcing its way through the earth. Fortunately, Hawaii's Kilauea volcano is one of the world's most monitored. Since April, scientists have noticed the lava lake dropping, a sign that a significant eruption might occur. We could see that the magma was withdrawing from those sites, that there was ground deformation, and it showed that those areas were deflating. And of course, there were the earthquakes that were made from the magma pushing its way through the rock. So we can track the earthquakes, and we could see that the magma was heading down towards the East Rift Zone. The volcano threatens large areas of housing to the east of Kilauea, including Leilani Estates, home to over 1,500 residents. Few of them have ever worried about living in the shadow of a volcano, until now. Local officials declare a state of emergency. The smell of sulfur fills the air, as slowly, with awesome, unstoppable power, Kilauea's fury emerges. On hearing the news, local cameraman Demian Berrios heads for the action but he has no idea what awaits him. I distinctly remember that moment where I first flew the drone up and I pointed the camera down and was a little bit disoriented, kind of trying to figure out where we were. Then all of a sudden, it just looked like a huge crack in the ground. And I remember looking at my son and he looked at me and he, he's like, Papa, is that lava? And it took about a minute before it really sunk in. Like, holy cow, this is really happening, right? From above, flaming fissures, or vents, can be seen burning a path through the forest. Hundreds of homes are now at risk, and as day one draws to a close, Hawaii's slow motion disaster is just beginning. Before it's done, Big Island will be changed forever. Alaska's southern coast lies in what's called the Ring of Fire, a line of volcanic activity that arcs from the shores of Chile up and across southern Alaska and down to the Philippines. There are 50 active volcanoes in Alaska, and two of them blow their top every year. This puts many Alaskans on a constant vigil for the next eruption including those who live here in the coastal town of Sitka on the state's southeastern panhandle. Just across the bay stands Mount Edgecombe, a now dormant volcano. On April 1st, 1974, when residents of Sitka saw black smoke pouring from the volcano, they panicked, assuming Edgecombe was rumbling to life. Little did they know, it was an April Fool's joke done by a local prankster. He'd hauled 70 tires into the crater and set them on fire. Funny for some, but not for others. Especially those who lived through the most powerful volcanic eruption of the 20th century, which happened right here in Alaska's Valley of 10,000 Smokes. A group of hikers is finishing a 12-mile trek 
They've come for a chance to experience one of the most amazing landscapes in Alaska, if not the world. These primitive cabins where they'll stay were first built by the University of Alaska Geophysical Institute as a research station to study the aftermath of the biggest volcanic eruption of the 20th century. It happened here in the early summer of 1912. In late May, a series of earthquakes started to rattle this once lush valley. The native Alaskan people who had lived here for hundreds of years sensed something was terribly wrong. Gathering their belongings, they fled just in time. On June 6th, a volcano named Novarupta suddenly exploded with cataclysmic force, a force 10 times greater than that of the Mount St. Helens eruption of 1980. Great geysers of magma shot into the sky. Rivers of superheated lava flowed into the valley. The sheer volume of what was ejected from Novarupta is still mind-boggling. 15 cubic kilometers of magma alone Rivers of superheated gas and ash raced into this valley 12 miles away, flattening lush forests and vaporizing trees, transforming it into the wide, desolate plain it is today. Mount Chimborazo is the highest peak in Ecuador at nearly 21,000 feet. But it's almost constant cloud cover sees it only rarely touched by the sun. Although Chimborazo is currently inactive, this sleeping giant is surrounded by other volcanoes that are very much awake. very angry. Reventador is one of 200 active volcanoes in Ecuador alone. In the last 500 years, it has erupted more than 25 times. The many volcanoes of the Northern Andes are still rising, pushed upwards by huge tectonic forces, just like the mountains around them. As they rise, the mountains create new landscapes for life to try its luck. Tropical downpours have carved the volcanic slopes into exceptionally deep valleys. The result is a collection of wildly diverse habitats, each evolving in its own extraordinary way. Our V-Day thought experiment begins at dawn. And to light the fuse, We'll start on Kilauea in Hawaii. It's one of the most active volcanoes on Earth and the ideal place to start imagining V-Day. When Kilauea erupted in May 2018, lava streamed out at over 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit, the equivalent of a blast furnace, flowing at 17 miles per hour, faster than most of us can run. Just one month into the eruption, the lava flows covered almost 14 square miles of land. 2,500 people lost their homes. No one knows when or if they'll be able to return. Kilauea, like all volcanoes, operates beyond human time. But without the volcano, the beautiful islands of Hawaii wouldn't exist. Millions of years ago, deep beneath the Pacific Ocean, abnormally hot rock began rising up from the Earth's interior. 
a hot spot. As the rock rises, it melts. And in this case, the magma erupts through the ocean floor, creating an underwater volcano, which builds up and eventually forms an island. This is the biggest hotspot on the planet. It's been producing lava like this for 80 million years at least. Although the hotspot's position is fixed, the Pacific Ocean floor is not. It's moving westwards by three and a half inches per year. As it does, each volcano stops erupting and a new one starts over millions of years, forming a string of volcanic islands. Kilauea is where the hotspot is still building Hawaii's big island today. Volcanoes built Hawaii, just as they have created 80% of the Earth's surface. But calling these islands home will always be risky. Kilauea volcano is by far the most active volcano in the world. There's nothing that comes close to it. It covers its entire surface every thousand years. At dawn on V-Day, Kilauea erupts in force, with lava flowing just as it did in 2018. And Kilauea is not alone. 97 other active hotspot volcanoes also erupt, pouring lava out across the globe. But that's only the beginning of our thought experiment, because most of Earth's volcanoes aren't formed from hotspots. There are over 1,400 active volcanoes on Earth today, and understanding them can be a matter of life or death. Now we are in the middle of a revolution in our understanding of how volcanoes work. Four billion years ago, auroras illuminate the infant atmosphere, the visual manifestation of the Earth's magnetic field, produced by its molten core. It's a shield that now protects the surface from the ravages of space radiation. Beneath this shield, in shallow coastal seas churned by the tides of the moon. Fueled by volcanic heat and seeded with organic molecules from space. Comes the very first life on Earth. Just how it begins remains a mystery. But at some point in this distant time, Chemistry becomes biology. For years, no one believed life could exist in toxic volcanic environments. But life is full of surprises. Today, our planet is much changed, but there remain some environments bearing similarities to early Earth. Iceland, one of the most volcanic regions of Earth. Just off its southern coast lies an isolated volcano named Surtsey. Surtsey is one of Earth's newest strips of land. In 1963, it exploded from the sea, erupting continuously for four years. It is now a world heritage site. Off limits to all, except a few research scientists. Surtsey's hot volcanic cracks and seams closely reproduce the environment of early Earth. The team drills cores of rock from hundreds of feet below. They search 
for the fingerprints of life. Marks made in the rock by deep dwelling microorganisms. Despite temperatures exceeding 250 degrees Fahrenheit, without oxygen and in acidic salty water, the rocks are clearly scarred by single-celled organisms feeding off the rock. Scientists are now finding these extremophile cells in volcanic zones across the globe. June 3rd, 2018. For the people of Guatemala, it's a day like any other. The volcano that towers above them is just part of the landscape. Known as Fuego, the volcano of fire, Guatemala's most active volcano sits dangerously close to several villages and towns. Fuego's monitoring station has only one seismograph. It shows a rise in activity, but nothing to indicate what's about to be unleashed. Early in the morning, Early in the morning on that day, June 3rd, bulletins started coming in as usual, but not a warning there could be a big explosion. 1 p.m. There's a massive explosion. Ash and rock blast high into the air. Yet strangely, there's no panic. People have witnessed frequent ash explosions for the last 16 years. Locals believe any fallout will spill into valleys lining the volcano slopes. But shortly after, disaster strikes. A deadly avalanche bursts over the hills. Residents flee for their lives. A boiling cloud of ash, known as pyroclastic flow, flows at up to 200 miles per hour and can be superheated to 1,800 degrees Fahrenheit. The searing ash burns your lungs. Death comes in an instant. Once the pyroclastic flow reaches the shallower or the flatter parts of the volcano, the ash cloud can then spread out across the countryside. They're impossible to escape from and impossible to outrun. The eruption of Fuego, its largest in four decades, is so big it can be seen from space. Ash reaches around 10 miles in the air. 60 square miles are blanketed in a suffocating layer. The first responders arrive around two hours later. Shocking sights greet them. Local journalist David Mercer grabs his camera and heads straight to the disaster zone. These are among the first images sent to the outside world. It was an incredibly surreal situation. All of the sound was kind of muffled by this thick layer of ash that was covering everything. It was monochrome. Everything was monochrome. Some places, you knew that there was a two-story house, and you could just see the very rooftop. So you knew that there was a couple of meters of this material, of this ash and lava and mud, all sort of joined together. Like a modern version of Pompeii, the last moments of life are frozen in time. 